again. You know who I am, so I'm not going to spend any time on that. We're going to do the same lightning round, at, and starting with Samantha, let's go down the line of just a quick line about what you do for a living, and another quick line about how you spend money. And I'll answer that by saying lately, only on food for my children, constantly. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. I'm Samantha Dion. I'm a financial advisor with Elvest, and Elvest believes that nothing bad happens when women have more money. Yes. We are on a mission to get more money than we have And I, let's see, experiences when I'm not spending money on food for my children <laughs> or on childcare. I love to spend my money on experiences. Yes. Hi, OCO. Uh, my name is Val Redhorsmull. I'm a Cherokee woman. Um, I am uh, an owner, uh, founder, and president of an investment bank, uh, an RIA on Wall Street, and I and my colleagues hope to dismantle the current systemic bias in finance on Wall Street at scale. And, uh, <laughs> how I spend my money, uh, I just celebrated 42 years of marriage to my UCLA sweetheart. <laughs>
I'm not very good with money. Uh, where do you think that came from? How do you and others dismantle that notion? Well, first of all, there is now empirical data that women founded companies and women led companies and companies with women on the board outperform their competition. And so, when you see the statistics we just saw, it's simply illogical. And it's, it's clear that there is a systemic problem. When we talk about the gender wealth gap, I think a lot of times we don't actually start at the top. We start with the jobs and the 401k plans and the childcare. And what we do have to understand is that in this country, most wealth that is generated is generated by corporate growth. And then the jobs are created from there and the 401k plans and the childcare plans. And I want to give you just a quick illustration to understand what I'm talking about. 40% of small businesses in this country, including California, are started by either women founders or people who identify as people of color. If you go to the capital markets and the publicly traded companies that have had big exits that have created billionaires, less than one-tenth of one percent, let me say that again, less than one-tenth of one percent are founded by either women or people of color. There is a gap there. And I want you to think about when Mark Zuckerberg took Facebook, which is now met in public, I live in Santa Clara County. He made a hundred billion dollars, and so did some of his investors and his employees. Tax dollars flowed into my community. He gave five billion to his favorite charity immediately. Imagine if Mount St. Mary's College got five billion. <laughs> but the point is, if we can have women take companies on that journey and then generate that kind of wealth, and they're controlling the companies, there's not going to be a wage gap with their jobs. There's not going to be childcare issues. There's going to be all the types of things that we want to see. And so the big gap that I work on every single day is not small business support. It's how do you get to that level. And it's a longer conversation, but it has to do with who's controlling the money on Wall Street. 98% of our assets are controlled by white male-led companies. And by the way, many white males want to be part of the solution. We have to change the system. It has to do with private equity, private debt, the whole spectrum of capital and access to that capital and dismantling barriers to that capital. <laughs> and and well, a big example of what if Mark Zuckerberg gave a big old chunk of change to Mount St. Mary's University. <laughs> 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 uh, Judy, can you talk about where the philanthropic dollars are, are or are not going when it comes to women-led initiatives. And how can philanthropy be involved in getting us to better gender equity? Sure, you're, you're gonna hear a constant theme. Um, first of all, let me tell you the bad news. The bad news is that less than 2% of philanthropic dollars are going to women and girls. There's been a slight uptick, but it's, it really hasn't moved too much. And so the question is why? Yet, philanthropy means uh, love of, I, I always say humankind, mankind. All of us have benefited from philanthropy, probably in this room, we all are philanthropists. But the issue is that philanthropy is also about money. Money and power, the trillions of dollars that are in philanthropic vehicles are there as a result of corporate profits, business um, you know, creation and transfer of wealth. And so who's held those dollars? Um, and the other issue is philanthropists give to what they know and what their values. And, you know, I've worked with some re really generous philanthropists, but I can tell you um, the number of folks that I've had to, you know, bring to East LA or bring to, to Oakland. So um, how can we change that is we need to get more wealth in the hands of women. And why do we want to do that is because study after study, doesn't matter, low income women, high net worth income women, black or white, women give more than men, in most cases, twice as much. So what we need to do is give more money in the hands. So that
that's one equation. But the other equation that we need to uh, pay attention to, giving is only one half, one part of it. The other is who's actually making those philanthropic dollars work. And that's nonprofit organizations on the ground. And so we need to give not we need to support a vibrant nonprofit sector. We need to get the hand, we need to get the money in the hands of organizations that are serving women and girls, like in New Way to Life, working on formerly incarcerated women. We need to be supporting organizations like the Trans Latino Coalition that really is really working um, in a community that's under siege. We need to support women foundations. We have one of the best women's foundations in the state, the California Women's Foundation, that's part of the network. And of course, we need to support higher education now and others. So it's really um, looking at opportunities to both, we're going to hear how we can create more wealth and getting that on the ground and supporting our nonprofit uh, organizations that are focusing on women and girls. Nancy, especially given what we just heard from Judy about the lack of support for women in the philanthropic field, it really highlights how important an organization like yours is. Could you give us some specific examples of what Women Connect for Good is doing to uplift women and girls, and how you, when you talk about connecting the dots, what that looks like connecting the dots on a national scale to California? Okay, I'm going to give you a term, and I want everyone to hear this term. It's social profit. This is something that we need to change in our society. Social profit. Think of all the organizations like the Red Cross, the Girl Scouts, all these 501c3s that people call not for profit. We have to change the way we think about philanthropy, but we have to change the way that our country is run. If every social profit organization stop today, where will we be? Every single one. So as far as, I, I talked about this, and it's so important, the collaboration, the partnerships. I would not be doing what I'm doing today without many, many people. I'm, I'm working with the ERA Coalition. I'm on that board. I, I'm not on board, but I'm part of the, I'm a pop, I, I should be. I am on board. I am now, okay, thank you. I want to hold on that. And then also take the lead. There, there are examples in this room of organizations <laughs> that Women Connect for Good is working with. But it is connected to dots. There are things that I don't want to do. Our, my organization is not good at doing. But take the lead, the ERA coalition. There are always, there's always someone that you can partner with that has resources. You know, they, they talk about kingdom comes. No, no, you're, you, are, you are there to, to join and to partner with each other. We're nothing without each other. We have a saying, you know, we're not, we are all in this together. And I think that's what I want you all to understand. Everyone in, the, everyone in this room can give, but you also give, to, give from your heart. Yes, uh, philanthropic is, is uh, it means champion, uh, lover of humanity, by the way. But everyone in this room can connect today with someone. I, I've never heard greater conversations of women talking. And also, the most important thing I hear is something about is money is a vehicle. Women need to get used to that idea. Money is a vehicle, it's a tool. It opens doors, it gets you where you want to, and it makes the be a better world for all of us. And I think that's what women are. We are about, we're about the problem solvers, we see our, in our families, in our communities, but when we come together, anything is possible. But again, it's the collaboration, it's the partnership, and it's the organizations that continue to help us thrive and be dedicated and excited about what we're doing. I'm so excited that my tribe is here today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad that you brought up Take the Lead and Grace. I'm, I was almost class of 2018, yes. and then I had a baby. So I had to miss a couple of but I see some of my cohorts here, and that's really lovely. I, I want to ask a question of the audience. Does anybody uh, ever listen to the public radio program Marketplace? It's just a so I listened to an interview with the host, Kyra Stahl, yesterday, um, with 
known for many years, and his lovely wife, Stephanie, who just got elected to a local city council race, and um, he had this kind of stunning admission. Here he is, he's been the national host of the big show on money for years. Guess who runs the budget in his household? I said, oh God, no, I should never run that thing. That's all my wife. And I, like, I, I, you know, sometimes I yell at my radio in the car, and I was like, Arr! because how common is that? How often do we find in our household that the women are the ones who are in charge of all the money, and yet we are not the ones investing in the money? And that is my long way of getting to you, Samantha, to give you an opportunity to talk about how we can move the needle when it comes to women as investors. Yeah, and I think it's important first to address the why. Why are we not investing? And you look at statistics like 98% of financial advisors, they're men. 99% of mutual funds are managed by men. 99%, like I, it's hard for me to believe, but it's true. And so you have an industry that's created by men for men. Was this some conspiracy when it started? No, but here we are today, we need to solve for this. We need to create a more inclusive industry. And what's really interesting about this, too, is that we also know that women are actual better investors. They have better investing outcomes. Why? Because when we have a plan, and we know when we do invest, well, I'll get to why we're not and how we should do it more, but when we do invest according to that plan, and we stick with the plan over the long run, which is key here, we perform better because Male investment advisors tend to chase the stock market, time the market. They're, they are, have you know, a greater risk tolerance, so they're kind of bouncing around. They don't stick to a plan over the long run. The S&P 500, over the last 100 years, has produced about a 10% average return. Does that mean it goes up 10% every year? Certainly not. We, most of us have been in the room long enough to have seen economic cycles. And so when we're really looking at investing as this tool, using it to you know, release our power as women, we need to start. And we need to start yesterday. So, and and we're, you know, how do we do this? Well, we need a plan. We need to know why we're investing. We need goals. Invest according to those goals, not how risky you're feeling on any given day. And you stick to the plan. And you need to get investing. And this is more for those of us that are new to it. It's not an age thing. It's not to say that the young people in the room haven't invested yet. Some of us haven't, and we're, we all just have this, we need to get started, right? So set your goals, get investing, stick to your plan, and do it consistently. Because even if you only have $50 to start investing today, if you stick to this plan, you will see this start to move the needle over time. So, you know, I will say, Elvest, we are a financial company built by women for women, and we're one of the first out there that offer the digital investing platform with a gender lens built into our algorithm. And so it's, it's, this, is, this is trying to move the middle needle on the wealth gap. Because when you, we have to make up for the fact that we make less, we take sabbaticals to care for others, we retire with less, and we live longer. We've already heard a lot of those statistics today. And so that, that, that algorithm is saying, hey, let's, let's, let's take an appropriate amount of risk in our investments so that we can get these women across the finish line with their investments. So, yeah. And we're going to do a little foreshadowing. We're going to have to make an exciting news on that front later on in this panel. But Valerie, I want to go to you and talk a little bit again back to that notion of dismantling Wall Street. And when we talk about access to capital, we really seem to be failing when it comes to intersectionality and women of color are struggling. <coughs> Why is that happening? What needs to be changed here? How can it be changed given the constraints we have? Well, I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit, and I do think financial literacy is essential because it, it is an opaque system right now. And when I talk to people who have any money invested anywhere, whether you have a 401k or your college endowment, and I ask them, do you understand who's managing the money? Do you understand the difference between asset classes? Most people say no. So 
really dig in and understand financial literacy. But if we go back to my comments about wealth being created, what happens is when wealth is created, whoever gets that wealth, whether it's a company or an individual, typically hires money managers to then put that money into different asset classes managed by fund managers. And that's what we're talking about. 98% of those are Caucasian male-led managers. Now, what we're doing at Known is we're taking our clients' money at their request and we're putting it all into either funds led by women or people of color. Now, the problem with that, society in finance will tell you you're taking a risk because they haven't had as much time in the business. You do not have a black woman-owned fund who can say, we've been around 100 years. Because what was happening 100 years ago? We're not going to get into that. But <laughs>
shout out to Zekaya and her comments really resonated with me because what we haven't really hit on the connection between wealth, money, and power and policy. And I was ignorant, so talking about mistakes, I was ignorant when I was younger about how much those were connected. Um, but I recently was working with an entity who wanted to put money into a very big name fund because there was a solid financial return and track record. And this is, by the way, I'm not gonna say the name, but it's one of the largest funds in the country, and the money they manage starts with a T, not a B. <laughs> and so this entity asked me to look into their entire footprint. Turns out they had a PAC, a political action committee, that was investing in things completely mission misaligned with our mission and values. And if you don't understand that connection, you might think, well, this is a good investment. They have a good financial track record, but what are they doing with their money? How are they politically motivated? So who are they
are a constituent, and if you ask questions, where is this money on my behalf being invested? You also have buying power. When you look at what companies you're buying from, do they have a wage gap? Are they, uh, do they lack more diversity? Have a voice because it doesn't matter how much you have in the bank, there's money that you can control and push and come together. In your bags are these, it's called the Lift Women Health Campaign. This is something that we started several years ago, but if each one of us in this room, men and women, students, everyone, if we lifted up another person as we rise in our companies, in our jobs, in our community, just think what the world would be like. Every time you, you go into a promotion or you learn something, you share that. 52 weeks, you can go on, there's an app, 52 weeks, of lifting yourself and others up. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> the ERA amendment is passed and the Lift and the Lift Women campaign is is made worldwide. Worldwide. <laughs>